So our teacher of the year this year is Professor Bob Brown from our department in our computing and software engineering school. But he was selected as one of the outstanding faculty award recipients last year and um, from that became our representative of the Teacher of the Year um, program that is officially run by the Cobb Chamber of Commerce and so it's a county-wide thing and Dr. Uh, Brown was our representative in that this year. His um, nomination for the outstanding faculty award was uh, was distinctive in a number of ways, one of which was that he was nominated both by colleagues and by students for that recognition. And among the things that were said about him in that nomination from the students included, he understands and relates extremely well with students. He is constantly looking for ways to improve his teaching style. Professor Brown is always considered a professional. He treats the students as if they were co-workers. And with that carries the professionalism and respect that you would give one. He goes above and beyond in many aspects, such as posting the PowerPoint slides from the class online along with the podcast recording of each lecture in the event a student misses the class and is easy to keep informed about what happened. He is always available for extra help or guidance. One student noted, I would even take classes that didn't make any sense for my scheduled term on, just so that I could take the class he taught. And another student said, I don't believe I've ever come across a professor so motivated to see a student succeed within the classroom. And that's really what teaching here is all about. Professor Brown received a master's degree in computer science from Southern Polytechnic State University in 1995 when the school's name was still the Southern College of Technology. And he's been teaching here since January of 1996. At the same time that he's teaching here full-time, he's also been working on PhD in the program at Nova Southeastern University. And his teaching follows a 30-year career in information technology beginning in 1996 and in, excuse me, medical informatics since 1974 when he began working with the Medical Association of Georgia to develop the methodology for medical care review, which assures the quality and appropriateness of medical care for Medicare patients. It says in many ways and in many venues that he teaches because it's rewarding to help students have the aha experience, and that's what he's going to focus on today. In addition to teaching, he's involved in a wide variety of outreach efforts here at Southern Polytechnic, including ones with the Girl Scouts, for which we are all grateful for his work there. We do have a number of former um, Teacher of the Year awardees um, that I'd like to recognize right now. All of you who've received this recognition in the past, please stand up and let us recognize you. Thank you for what you continue to do for our students. It's now my very great pleasure to introduce this year's Teacher of the Year, Professor Bob Brown. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. It is hard to be humble and proud at the same time. And I'm probably going to get all misty before this is all over, just, just from listening to what some of my students wrote. I am very honored to be here. I am so astonished to be here. Dr. Rosbacher told me about this while we were heading for some sort of meeting. We were walking across the campus, probably doing something having to do with accreditation. And she told me that I had been selected, and I'm afraid I was so astonished that I was a little bit ungracious. My mouth dropped open, and I kind of didn't say anything. Um, I did seek her out and apologize for that later. And it's taken about a year, but it looks like she's forgiven me by, <laughs> by now. I hope so. I wanted to spend just a few minutes today. I have been counseled that short is good. Uh, I wanted to spend just a few minutes today talking about what, me, what makes me tick as a teacher and present a couple of examples. Everybody has already encountered the fact that Eureka is Greek for aha. It was Archimedes of Syracuse who was trying to solve the problem 
of whether the goldsmith had cheated King Hiram by alloying the gold that the king had provided for making a crown with some silver and then keeping back some of the gold for himself. Archimedes supposedly had this aha experience, although he spoke Greek, so he didn't call it aha, right? Um, in the bath, realizing that a, an object of irregular shape displaced its volume in water. And so one could build a water balance, two objects of equal mass but different volume. The object of the larger volume would be more buoyant and the balance would tilt and show whether there was a difference, if in fact there was. It turns out that aha is also German for aha, and that people have been studying, well, yeah, people have been studying the aha experience for over a century at least. Karl Bula coined the term aha or leapness back in 1907 to describe this experience of sudden insight. Not long after that, Wolfgang Kohler was doing experiments with chimpanzees. The, he, the chimpanzees realized that uh, they could get to an out of reach banana if they stood on a box. And prior to call his exp experiments, it was thought that animals accomplish things by trial and error only. The, the box demonstration and later some demonstrations with sticks that could be fit together seem to show that there is insight and, and cognitive process going on in chimpanzees. Um, in 2002, a researcher named Weir observed the same thing in Caledonian crows. So you got somebody with a brain the size of a bird who, <laughs> uh, who can have the aha experience. What was interesting to me is that Mark Jung Beeman and John Kunos, um, Beeman is at Northwestern University and Kunos at Drexel, have been doing research into the AHA experiment, experience using functional magnetic resonance imagery and electroencephalography. And they have developed quite a convincing body of evidence that the aha experience, the insight or the intuition, happens in the right brain, and that linear thinking, one step at a time, I'm a one step at a time linear thinker person, that that one step at a time linear thinking happens in the left brain. Insight seems to me to be the distillation of knowledge and experience. There, if, if you read a little bit about people who, who write popularly about insight, one of the things you'll read is, well, why would we bother going to school if we have this aha experience and, and solve problems? And the answer to that is that you don't get the aha experience until you have the background that leads you up to it. There are a number of examples. I've already talked about Archimedes of Syracuse. Newton's story of the apple is one that he apparently told himself, but he had been thinking about universal gravitation for about a decade before that aha experience with the apple in the garden. Poincaré says that he figured out non, non you can't say that when you're nervous, non-Euclidean non, non geometry while he was walking up the steps onto a bus. All of a sudden there's an insight. But it's a problem that he had been working on for years. The, the solution happened in that minute of stepping onto the bus, but the, the work that was behind the solution took a number of years. Thomas Edison says the first step to invention is intuition, and then comes a burst of problems. So you do the intuition, then you, then you figure out the hard part. If you read the popular literature a little bit, and I've, I've been, I picked this topic back in the fall, and I have been poking at it. For, for, for several months. If you read the popular literature, you get the idea that the aha experience leads one to something novel. And that's certainly the case with Archimedes, with Poincaré, with Edison. But I don't think it's a necessary component. I think novelty is perhaps there, but not essential. And in any case, even if material is not new, it's novel to the students. It might be stuff that, that 
we've known for a long time, but it's new to the students. And so it's my belief that students who get it have that aha experience when the pieces suddenly fit together and they can stop doing the left brain one step at a time thinking and start doing the insightful thinking with the right brain. One of these days I'm going to get there, but never mind about that now. The aha experience is an important thing. It is particularly important to the student because I think it does, and you got to know that I have no training in psychology whatsoever. I'm making this up out of whole cloth, right? Um, I think that that might mark the transition from memorizing facts and thinking linearly to the beginning of mastery of a subject so that one can begin to have insights. And for the teacher, it is one of the most rewarding experiences that we can have when somebody says, now I get it. You've been pounding on this with the kid for about a year, right? And all of a sudden you get the, now I get it. And it, um, my, my SPSU webpage used to say that the reason I teach is because it's fun to watch the students have that aha experience. Somebody asked me whether I was making fun of students, and, uh, and so I revised that a little bit. It, it had never occurred to me that anybody would, would take it that way, but I revised it a little bit, just to be sure. I got started being interested in helping people have the aha experience in the dark ages before computer science. I, I was doing computing when we had to get up early in the morning and shovel coal into the computer. And <laughs> yes, it was uphill both ways. <laughs> now, now, I joke, but one of the first computers that I spent a lot of time with had a mercury delay line memory. Semiconductor memory hadn't been invented yet. And yes, it had to warm up before it would work. You couldn't just come in and turn it on and use it. Very few computer science programs when I started doing this stuff. And so computer programmers were trained either in trade schools or on the job. And many organizations had on the job training programs for programmers. I did that with the city government of Atlanta from 1970 to 1974. And then later with the Medical Association of Georgia, but to a lesser extent. One of the techniques that I developed for that on-the-job training was, I got to check and be sure that my notes and the slides are in sync because I can't see that thing. Um, one of the techniques that I developed was something that I called the 25 cent lesson. One of the trainees would come to me with a question and I'd answer the question and then say something like, well, would you like a 25 cent lesson in sorting? And the answer was almost always yes, not because this coworker had a burning need to know the theory of sorting, but because it was relevant right at the moment. There was a problem to be solved that, that required that answer. And so I gave a lot of 25 cent lessons and never collected a quarter from any one of them. What I did do was find out that I enjoyed helping people learn. One of the luckiest things that ever happened to me was an adjunct instructor bailed out on Mike Murphy the week between Christmas and New Year's, back when we were on the quarter system and winter quarter started January 2nd. And so I get this phone call in the dark days after Christmas um, from Mike Murphy, who at that time was the chair of the computer science department, and who said, hey, I got a deal for you. How'd you like to teach a college class the day after tomorrow? Uh, <laughs> And I, I later found out that Harbert put him up to it. Um, but I said yes, and it was one of the best things that has happened to me in the last several decades. I knew that I liked helping people learn things. I wasn't sure how I was going to do as a college teacher. And that first term was a little rough. Exam one came around, and I went into Murphy's office, and I said, I've given them an exam that was too hard and you know, almost too long. What shall I do about it? And he said, well, make the next one easier. This, this is not hard stuff. <laughs> this is not hard stuff. 
Um, I have come to find out that teaching is about learning. There are some classes that I've been teaching for seven or eight years here. Um, and I learn something new every term about the material in that class. Teaching is about helping other people learn. And particularly in this environment, but in general, people love it when you help them learn something new. Teaching is about enjoying the presence of young people. I am invisible to teenagers off, off of this college campus. People my age don't exist, right? They'll look right through you if you're at the mall or something. But uh, they don't have any choice but to interact with me when I'm here. <laughs> and um, sometimes there's a certain amount of sucking up. I got a compliment that I had a nice beard today from a woman student. Well, it's the same beard I've had since 1976, right? <laughs> um, but most important, teaching is about that learning breakthrough. In the large, the breakthrough is people realizing that they can learn, that they can master a subject, that they can become experts. But in the small, it's that aha experience where they, where they assimilate one particular fact so well that they can think with their right brain with that fact. And I hope that the sum of those small aha experiences leads inevitably to that learning breakthrough in the large. I read some, something by Adam Johnston who was, said that he was glad he was a teacher. His other choice of career would have been rock star, but uh, describes teaching as, I think, really hard I try to understand something so completely that I can create a story that translates and explains that understanding to someone else. Then I get to show and tell and play with chalk. Then I go back to my office and think really hard again and create the next story. Students really seem to need that aha experience, and I'm glad when I am able to provide it for them. Yeah, I promised I'd do this fast, and I'm going to try to, but I want to provide two examples, both of these from teaching, one of them a single aha experience, and the other one that has developed into a teaching technique. Everybody who has bought a computer knows that computers have clocks and that the clock speed is important. Faster clock speed, faster computer, at least in general. And so we talk about computer processors as being the two gigahertz processor or the three gigahertz processor. Most of you don't care, but students of computer architecture and computer hardware need to care. And so I need to explain that to them in a way that they get. In order to do that, I need to explain the term nanosecond to them. And that turned out not to be as easy as I thought it was going to be. The illustration on the slide is a fairly simplified data path of a computer. The data path is the heart of the computer. It's the computer's registers. That's the column of boxes in the middle. The arithmetic and logic unit that does the actual computation, the kind of V-shaped thing at the bottom, and the buses that connect them. There are two gray bus lines coming out of the registers and going into the arithmetic and logic unit on the right side of that drawing and a black one leading the data back to the registers on the left side. So the data go around and around in the computer from the registers through the arithmetic logic unit and back. And that is how computation happens in a computer. For every clock cycle, five things happen. First, the electronics in the computing machine set up the control signals that are going to control one particular computation, the one that happens in this clock cycle. Data flow from the registers along those two vertical gray lines, the A and B buses, to the arithmetic logic unit. The arithmetic logic unit performs an arithmetic operation, or as you might suspect, a logical operation, under the command of those control signals. So it can add, subtract, multiply, divide, um, compare, all of the things you expect computers to do, and the control signals select one of those operations. The result of the computation travels along the C bus, that's that heavy black line, and finally the result 
of the computation is stored in one of the registers. Okay. I take about a week to explain that in, in, in a computer architecture course. But a clock in a computer processor is not something that tells time. It ticks like a metronome, only much faster, keeping the parts of the computer all playing well together and synchronized with each other. We measure clock speed in hertz. Uh, hertz is defined to be inverse time, one over time. So a two gigahertz clock is a clock that ticks every half a billionth of a second. Now, all of the electronics in a computer are computing more or less continuously. That arithmetic logic unit looks at its input, it does arithmetic or logic, and it produces an output. But the result of that computation is only valid at particular points in time. So we have the signal there. Um, clock cycle one starts here, the slide says, up in the upper left-hand corner. And it's that transition from high to low in the computer clock that starts setting up the control signals and begins the process. The process is a, is a continuous process once it's started by the falling edge of that clock cycle. So the control signals reach stable values. The data from the registers drive the A and B bus, and you can see those in order on the slide. The arithmetic logic unit does its computation. It's computing continuously, but its result isn't valid until it has valid input, and then sometime after that, because these, these things don't happen instantaneously. Finally, the result of the computation is propagated to that C bus, the big heavy black line on the previous slide, and stored in the destination register. The last interval on there is labeled tolerance there is some slack time to allow any part that might have gotten behind to catch up. Here's why. Not all electronic components are alike when they come out of the factory, and so that arithmetic logic unit might be a little slower or a little faster in one computer than in another. The engineers who design these things know what the limits are and build in sufficient tolerance so that by the time the clock cycle, the clock rises, uh, as shown in the diagram there where it says registers loaded from C bus on rising edge, by that time we're sure that the computation is complete and correct. We've allowed enough extra time to, to account for that necessary tolerance. All right, students come in with the idea that I can crank up the clock speed and my computer will go faster because the clock is what makes the, the computer speed what it is. And sometimes they are amazed when you show them this diagram and say, you know what, if you crank up the clock speed, what you're doing is reducing the tolerance. Everything else is still happening at the same speed. And if you reduce that tolerance band enough, your computer is going to start producing wrong answers. And then I tell them, you know, you probably can't do that because the other part of engineering is if you crank up the clock speed enough, your CPU is going to melt. As the clock runs faster, more computations take place per second. The central processing unit uses more electricity, generates more heat, and it was engineered to conduct a certain amount of heat away from it in every second. So probably by the time you get to the point of getting wrong answers, you will have let all the smoke out of your computer and it won't work anymore. Right, some students conclude that computers run on smoke from, from that, right, you let the smoke out of it, it starts working. But I gave this lecture last fall, in, in much more time than I'm spent here, gave this lecture last fall, and somebody who had been sitting in the kind of midway back in the classroom sat up and said, oh, and, and I called on him, Mr. Smith, he says, I finally understand what the clock is for. This was the aha experience, and it made my day. It just absolutely, positively made my day. When we talk about computer clocks, we have to talk about nanoseconds. If we're talking about gigahertz, hertz are inverse time, so we turn that into seconds, and we're talking about billionths of a second, really small amounts of time. And I used to stand up and say, a nanosecond, that's a billionth of a second. 
and went on to the next thing. Nah, no frame of reference. So I actually went directly to the thing I'm going to tell you about in a minute. But for, for this purpose, I talked to some friends and considered some other frames of reference. Uh, and I blink, 250 million nanoseconds. Okay, that does, that, nah. Students know how fast an eye blink is, but they don't have a clue about 250 million nanoseconds there. They got a frame of reference, but the frame of reference is too distant from the thing they are trying to comprehend. The time for one generation in a fusion reaction, 10 nanoseconds. We're talking about fast neutron fusion here, A-bombs. Students will listen when you talk about A-bombs, right? The things that blow up. But the fact is that it's an unfamiliar frame of reference, so that one doesn't help either. And that left me with the question of, well, then what? How do I explain nanoseconds? I have two heroes of computing. One of them is John von Neumann. Von Neumann died in 1957 when I was 10 years old. Um, and so I never had a chance to, to interact with him. But I did have a chance to meet Grace Murray Hopper twice once in 1974 and again about 1985. Um, the picture was taken in 1984 when she held the rank of Commodore in the US Navy. She retired some years later as a rear admiral after having, among other things, set a record for the longest period of active duty in the US Armed Force, temporary active duty. Let's call her back temporarily after the war, right, and let her go in 1990. This is World War II, that war. Um, it was she on whom we tell the tale of the first actual computer bug being found. Uh, engineers and scientists called the small glitches bugs for a long time. It, there's, there's no thought that Dr. Hopper coined that word, but she and her colleagues found a moth in the innards of the Mark II relay calculator at Harvard causing the calculator not to work, pulled the moth out, taped it in the logbook, and annotated it, first actual case of finding a bug. So it didn't coin the word, but found the bug. People who know her call, call her, or did call her, Amazing Grace. She could put on a little old lady act that wouldn't quit. By the way, she was 78 years old when she was a Commodore in 1984. And she would get mistaken for an elevator operator, right? Because a little old lady with a cap here in the hotel. Um, Navy captain by that time, PhD from Yale, right? But she's going to be the elevator operator. She tells the story of explaining to one of her staff that she didn't understand nanoseconds. And so they tried to explain it in much the same way that I tried to a few minutes ago. And they were cutting, but she wasn't bleeding. And she finally said, show me a nanosecond. Bring one in here and let me look at it. Well, when an admiral tells a Navy chief, show me a nanosecond, the chief says, yes, sir, ma'am, and, and goes off to show her a nanosecond, right? There's no arguing about that. And according to Dr. Hopper, what the chief came back with was a piece of wire about 11 and 3 quarters inches long. This is a nanosecond. Here's how long it takes for an electrical signal to travel, an electrical signal to travel this far in one nanosecond at the speed of light. That is something that students can deal with. We have Ms. Megan Cox, who is a student in CS3224 this term, and who kindly agreed to illustrate nanosecond. I've got something that fits within the student's frame of reference. They can do a nanosecond is about this long. And they can understand that that's as far apart as you can get two things if you're going to send an electronic signal between them in one nanosecond. And I, I guess I have to pull out a Dr. Grace Murray Hopper prediction here. She predicted that the supercomputers of this century, uh, she died January 1st, 1992, so didn't see this century. But her prediction was that the supercomputer of this century will be something about the size of a basketball. 
have a diameter of about a nanosecond, and be immersed in liquid nitrogen for the purpose of dissipating that heat. We haven't seen that yet, but we will. I try to tailor my teaching to individual courses. So depending on what I'm teaching, I might do it a little bit differently and to the extent that it's possible to individual students. I try to combine theory and application to answer the why questions as well as supplying the what. And I hope that I elicit from students critical thinking the ability to generalize. I, I'll learn a set of facts and generalize from those to solve new problems, problems that I haven't seen before. And I hope that I elicit that aha experience. So I get this bimodal grade distribution, right? The, the curve with two humps in it. And the first time I got one of those, I asked Dr. Rich Halstead Nusslock, because he had been here for a while then and I was brand new, what does this mean? And he tapped the left edge of the curve and he said, it means these students get it and these students don't. So, okay, <laughs> I can understand that. And from that point, I started wondering, how can, how can I make the hump of students that get it get bigger and the hump of students that don't get it get smaller? I'm getting there. I did I, a look at five years worth of grades and 59% of my students in all classes over five years earned grades of A or B. And I so far haven't gotten any gripes from the folks who, who teach the follow-on classes about why did you let these unprepared bozos into my class. So I think those are, are pretty solid A's or B's. I get pretty good results in uh, feedback from students, but that's also bimodal. They either really like it or they don't like it at all. They hate it. Um, I got to show you this. I know you can't read it, and that's okay. And in fact, I have redacted the student's last name, but I, I've excerpted a little bit on the next slide. This student earned a grade of C on the first exam in one of my classes and a grade of D on the second exam. And I had one of these discussions and got, well, you know, I'm playing basketball and I really don't have all this time to study. And I'm afraid I said something cruel. Do we have anybody from the athletic department in here? I'm afraid I said if you came to college to play basketball, you're in the wrong place. Uh, <laughs> and then I got two tears and a chin quiver. And she said, but if I quit, the team won't have five girls. <laughs> so I felt low enough to crawl under a snake with a hat, high hat on. But, uh, but we continued this, the discussion and talked a little bit about balancing time and doing some studying. This kid earned a grade of 106% on the final exam. Every single one of the regular questions and two out of three of the extra credit questions. And I got a note, see I told you I was going to get all misty, got the note that you saw saying, thank you for staying on my back. You can't beat that. Then I got this note. And there it is in the middle. I don't know if you know, but I actually took six classes from you. The implication of that is you've got to be crazy to take six <laughs> classes from Brown because that's a lot of work. Um, but I also got some good out of it. Let's see, where am I? Time to finish up so we can get to the cookies. Uh, well, yeah, the cookies are the important part of this thing. I enjoy learning from my colleagues and I learn something new from them every day. I do try to read. I learn from my students both formally and even more likely informally. And I enjoy doing that. I try new techniques. You heard about podcasting. Um, one of the things that not all of you have heard about is I got tired of the hand wringing. Oh, I had a car wreck and I can't do my homework. What I've done is assign my students a pool of late days. You turn your homework in, you got five of these things, right, for the whole semester. If you decide that pizza and an age-appropriate beverage is better than doing your homework, go do that. You got a late day for it. But remember, when they're gone, they're gone. And that works. I don't hear sob stories anymore. And I mostly don't get late homework 
anymore. Dr. Rossbacher mentioned the Girl Sprouts, and uh, this picture doesn't really have anything to do with what I'm talking about other than the joy of being around young people. This is one of the attendees at our Geek Squad Summer Academy from this past summer. Warning, they'll be back. <laughs> uh, the last week in July, we will have the Geek Squad Summer Academy on the campus again. There will be more than 100 Girl Scouts, maybe 60 of them staying in the dorms. And I'll be pacing around saying, why did I ever do this to myself? But you know something, in 2011, I'll be doing it again. That is everything that I have to say, except I'm told that I have to take questions. And I also want to say that I, I was deputized by Admiral Dr. Grace Murray Hopper to make nanoseconds. And so I have a supply of Grace Hopper nanoseconds here for anybody who wants one. I've taken these to class, and the students pick them up and take them. They, they really do. So are there questions? Or not, as the case may be. And I think there was a question over here. Dr. Rossbacher? Who are the teachers who made an impression on you when you were in school? Teachers who made an impression on me. Um, I get <laughs> You mean I can't tell you about the advisor who told me I should transfer to the University of Georgia and major in forestry? Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, there are more teachers who made an impression on my life than I can count or recount, but I have a, a tale to tell about that, and it's a tale of me being extremely personally lucky. In grade school, I got the facts, just the facts, just learn this stuff, and, and it'll be all right. And I, you know, school was something you did. It wasn't particularly exciting, but you couldn't get out of it, so you might just as well do it. And then I went off to high school, a public high school, Baker High in Columbus, Georgia, and I was extremely lucky to go to that school while Dr. Fred Kirby was principal. He hired a bunch of smart teachers, many of them from Alabama Polytechnic, now Auburn University, and then he let them teach. And so I learned a whole bunch about the whys and wherefores, and perhaps a little bit less about the facts, just the facts and came away from high school thinking that that was the most fun I had ever had in my life. And you know what? If you can have somebody come away from school saying, that's the most fun I've ever had in my life, you have done very well. So I guess maybe the biggest influence was Dr. Fred Kirby. Other questions? I'm between you and the cookies. But I, but I think there's a, I think there's a uh, minimum number of questions before Dr. Rossbacher will stand up. And, yes, Orlando. Hand would probably kill me, but I wanted to know this fact. How many classes are you teaching? Well, well, it depends on how you count them. Um, if you count them Hans way, well, I don't know, but I'm teaching 19 semester hours if you count it the regular way. He counts them differently, and it comes. <laughs> Or actually, Venu told, tells me I'm teaching 21 semester hours because he counts them differently, too. So I don't know, um, but I do have a schedule outside my door, and I consult it every day to figure out where I'm supposed to be next. Any other questions for me? Thank you very much.